Book four, chapter nine of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine De Vio and Staupitz, Staupitz and Luther, Luther and Spalatin Communion, Departure of Staupitz and Link, Luther to Cajetan, Luther's Departure appeal to the pope still the news brought to him were not at all satisfactory the rumour in the town was that if he would not retract he was to be seized and immured in a dungeon the vicar-general of the order stapitz himself it was confidently said had been obliged to consent to it luther cannot believe what is told him of his friend no stapitz will not betray him as to the designs of the cardinal judging by his own words it is difficult to doubt still he is unwilling to flee before the danger his life like truth herself is in mighty hands and notwithstanding of the danger which threatens him he resolves not to quit augsburg the legate soon repented of his violence he felt that he had gone out of his course and he was desirous to return to it scarcely had Staupitz finished dinner it was the morning when the interview had taken place and the dinner hour was midday when he received a message from the cardinal to wait upon him Staupitz was accompanied by Wincislaus link the vicar-general found the legate alone with serra longa de vio immediately went up to Staupitz and in the mildest accents said to him try then to persuade your monk and induce him to make a retraction of a truth i am otherwise satisfied with him and he has not a better friend than i staupitz i have done so already and will still counsel him to submit to the church in all humility de vio you must answer the arguments which he draws from holy scripture staupitz i must confess to you my lord that that is beyond my strength for dr martin is my superior both in talent and in knowledge of the holy scriptures the cardinal doubtless smiled at the vicar-general's frankness he himself knew besides wherein lay the difficulty of convincing luther he continued and said to link are you aware that as partisans of a heretical doctrine you are yourselves liable to the pains of the church Staupitz, deign to resume the conference with luther appoint a public discussion of the controverted points de vio terrified at the very idea i won't have any further discussion with that beast for it has in its head piercing eyes and strange speculations staupitz at last obtained the cardinal's promise to give luther a written statement of what he was to retract the vicar-general went immediately to luther and shaken by the cardinal's representations tried to bring about some arrangement refute then says luther the passages of scripture which i have brought forward it is above my power said staupitz well said luther it is against my conscience to retract so long as no other explanation can be given of these passages what continued he the cardinal pretends as you assure me that he is desirous to arrange the affair without shame or disadvantage to me ah these are roman words and signify in good german that it would be my disgrace and eternal ruin what else has he to expect who from fear of man and against the voice of his conscience abjures the truth Staupitz did not insist he merely intimated that the cardinal had consented to give him a written statement of the points of which he demanded a retraction then doubtless he informed him of his resolution to leave augsburg where he had nothing more to do and luther imparted to him a design which he had formed with a view to comfort and strengthen their souls staupitz promised to return and they separated for a short time luther left alone in his cell turned his thoughts towards the friends who were dear to his heart he transported himself to weimar and wittemberg he was desirous to inform the elector of what was passing and afraid of compromising the prince by addressing him directly wrote to spalatin and begged him to inform his master how matters stood 
he related the whole affair even to the promise of the legate to give him a written statement of the controverted points and concluded thus matters are but i have neither hope nor confidence in the legate i will not retract a single syllable i will publish the reply which i have sent him in order that if he proceeds to violence his shame may extend over all christendom the doctor next availed himself of some moments still left him to communicate with his friends at wittemberg peace and felicity wrote he to dr karlstadt accept these few lines as if they were a longer letter for time and events are pressing on me another time i will write you and others at greater length for three days my affair has been under discussion and things are now come to this that i have no hope of returning to you and expect nothing but excommunication the legate is absolutely determined that i shall have no discussion either public or private he says he wishes not to be my judge but my father and yet the only words he will hear from me are i retract and own that i have been mistaken these again are words which i won't say my cause is in so much the greater peril that its judges are not only implacable enemies but moreover men incapable of comprehending it however the lord god lives and reigns to his care i commend myself and i doubt not that in answer to the prayers of some pious souls he will send me assistance methinks i feel that i am prayed for either i shall return to you without having suffered harm or struck with excommunication will be obliged to seek an asylum elsewhere be this as it may comport yourself valiantly stand firm exalt christ intrepidly and joyfully the cardinal always calls me his dear son i know what this amounts to nevertheless i am persuaded i would be to him the dearest and most agreeable of men if i would only pronounce the single word revoco i retract but i will not become a heretic by retracting the faith which made me become a christian better be hunted cursed burned and put to death take care of yourself my dear doctor and show this letter to our theologians to amsdorf philip Autumn and others in order that you may pray for me and also for yourselves for the affair which is here discussed is yours also it is that of faith in our lord jesus christ and of divine grace delightful thought which ever gives full peace and consolation to those who have borne testimony to jesus christ to his divinity and grace when the world from all quarters showers down its censures ejections and frowns our cause is that of faith in our lord and how sweet also the conviction expressed by the reformer i feel that i am prayed for the reformation was the work of prayer and piety the struggle between luther and de vio was a struggle between the religious element reappearing in full life and the expiring remains of the quibbling dialectics of the middle ages such was luther's converse with his absent friends staupitz soon returned dr ruhel and the chevalier de felitzoch the elector's envoys also arrived after they had taken leave of the cardinal some other friends of the gospel joined them and luther seeing the generous men thus assembled on the point of separating perhaps separating from himself for ever proposed that they should join in celebrating the lord's supper the proposal was accepted and this little flock of believers communicated in the body and blood of jesus christ what feelings must have filled the hearts of these friends of the reformer at this moment when celebrating the eucharist with him and thinking that it was perhaps the last time he would be permitted to do so what joy and love must have animated luther's heart at seeing himself so graciously received by his master at an hour when men were repulsing him how solemn must that supper have been how sacred that evening the next day luther waited for the articles which the legate was to send him but no message arriving he begged his friend dr vincislaus link to go to the cardinal 
De Vio received Link with the greatest affability, and assured him that he would act only as a friend. I no longer, says he, regard Dr. Martin Luther as a heretic. I will not excommunicate him at this time, at least if I do not receive other orders from Rome. I have sent his reply to the Pope by an express. Then, to give a proof of his good intentions, he added, Would Dr. Martin Luther only retract what relates to the indulgences, the affair would soon be ended, for, with regard to faith in the sacrament, it is an article which every one may interpret and understand in his own way. Spalatin, who relates these words, adds the sarcastic but just remark, it clearly follows that Rome has more regard for money than for the purity of the faith and the salvation of souls. Link returned to Luther. He found Staupitz with him, and gave an account of his visit. When he mentioned the legate's unlooked-for concession, it had been worth while, said Staupitz, for Dr. Winceslaus to have had a notary and witnesses with him to take down the words, for if such a proposal was known, it would greatly prejudice the cause of the Romans. Meanwhile, the smoother the prelate's words became, the less the honest Germans trusted him. Several of the worthy men to whom Luther had been recommended consulted together. The legate, said they, is plotting some mischief by the courier of whom he speaks. There is good ground to fear that you will all be seized and cast into prison. Staupitz and Wenceslaus, therefore, determined to quit the town. Embracing Luther, who persisted in remaining at Augsburg, they set out in all haste by different roads for Nuremberg, not without a feeling of great uneasiness as to the fate of the intrepid witness whom they left behind. Sunday passed quietly enough. Luther waited in vain for a message from the legate. But as he did not send him a word, Luther at last resolved to write him. Staupitz and Link, before their departure, had begged him to make all possible submission to the cardinal. Luther was yet without experience in Rome and its envoys, but if submission did not succeed, he would be able to regard it as a warning. Now he must at least make the attempt. In so far as concerns himself, not a day passes in which he does not condemn himself, does not mourn over the facility with which he allows himself to be hurried into expressions which exceed the bounds of propriety. Why should he not confess to the cardinal that which he daily confesses to God? Luther, moreover, had a heart which was easily touched, and which suspected no evil. He therefore took up the pen, and, under a feeling of respect and goodwill, wrote to the cardinal as follows. Most worthy father in God, I come once more, not with my voice, but by writing, to supplicate your paternal goodness to give me a favourable hearing. The Reverend Dr. Staupitz, my very dear father in Christ, has asked me to humble myself, to renounce my own opinion, and submit it to the judgment of pious and impartial men. He also has lauded your paternal goodness, and convinced me of the favourable sentiments with which you are animated towards me. The tidings filled me with joy. Now then, most worthy father, I confess, as I have already done, that I have not shown enough of modesty, enough of meekness, enough of respect for the name of the sovereign pontiff, and although I have been greatly provoked, I perceive it would have been far better for me to have treated the affair with more humility, good nature, and reverence, not answering a fool according to his folly, for fear of being like unto him. Proverbs 26, verse 4. This grieves me very much. I ask pardon for it, and I am willing to announce it to the people from the pulpit, as indeed I have already often done. I will endeavour, by the grace of God, to speak differently. Moreover, I am ready to promise that, unless I am asked, I will not say a single word on the subject of indulgences after this affair is arranged. But, in like manner, let those who led me to begin it be obliged hereafter to be moderate in their discourses, or to be silent. As regards the truth of my doctrine, the authority of St. Thomas and other doctors cannot satisfy me. If I am worthy of it, I must hear the voice of the spouse, who is the church. 
for it is certain that she hears the voice of the bridegroom who is christ with all humility and submission therefore i pray your paternal love to refer the whole of this matter which to this hour is so uncertain to our most holy lord leo x in order that the church may decide pronounce and ordain thereby enabling men to retract with a good conscience or to believe in sincerity the reading of this letter suggests a reflection it shows us that luther was not acting on a premeditated system but only in virtue of convictions which were successively impressed on his mind and his heart so far from having adopted a fixed system or calculated opposition he was sometimes without suspecting it at variance with himself old convictions still prevailed in his mind even after contrary convictions had taken root and yet in these evidences of sincerity and truth men have searched for weapons to assail the reformation because it followed the obligatory law of progress invariably imposed on the human mind they have written the history of its variations in the very traits which attest its sincerity and consequently do it honour one of the greatest geniuses of christendom has found his strongest objections to it inconceivable is the waywardness of the human mind luther received no answer to his letter cajetan and his courtiers from being violently agitated became all at once motionless what could the reason be might it not be the calm which precedes the storm some are of the opinion of pallavicini who observes that the cardinal expected that the proud monk would like inflated bellows gradually lose the wind with which he was filled and become quite humble others who thought themselves better acquainted with the ways of rome felt assured that the legate was preparing to seize luther but not daring of his own accord to proceed to such extremities in defiance of the imperial safe conduct was waiting for an answer from rome others again could not admit that the cardinal would consent to wait so long the emperor maximilian they said and this may indeed have been true would have no more scruple in delivering up luther to the judgment of the church in spite of the safe conduct than sigismund had in delivering up john huss to the council of constance their conjecture therefore was that the legate was negotiating with the emperor the sanction of maximilian might arrive at any hour the greater the opposition he had formerly shown to the pope the more disposed he now seemed to flatter him until he should succeed in encircling the head of his grandson with the imperial crown there was not an instant to be lost and therefore said the generous men around luther prepare an appeal to the pope and quit augsburg without delay luther whose presence in the town had for four days been quite useless and who by remaining these four days after the departure of the saxon counsellors whom the elector had sent to watch over his safety had sufficiently demonstrated that he feared nothing and was ready to answer every charge at length yielded to the urgent entreaties of his friends wishing to leave a notification to de vio he wrote to him on tuesday the evening before his departure this second letter is firmer in its tone than the former it would seem that luther in perceiving that all his advances were vain began to hold up his head and show that he had a due sense both of his own rights and of the injustice of his enemies most worthy father in god wrote he to de vio your paternal goodness has seen yes i say seen and distinctly recognized my obedience i have undertaken a distant journey in the midst of great dangers in much bodily weakness and notwithstanding of my extreme poverty on the order of our most holy lord leo x i have appeared personally before your eminence in fine i have thrown myself at the feet of his holiness and am now waiting his pleasure prepared to acquiesce in his judgment whether he condemn or acquit me i thus feel that i have omitted nothing which becomes an obedient son of the church hence i cannot see it to be my duty uselessly to prolong my sojourn here indeed it is impossible for me to do so 
i want means and your paternal goodness has commanded me in peremptory terms not again to show myself in your presence unless i am willing to retract i depart therefore in the name of the lord desiring if it be possible to repair to some spot where i may be able to live in peace several personages of greater weight than i am have urged me to appeal from your paternal goodness and even from our most holy lord leo the tenth ill informed to himself better informed although i know that such an appeal will be much more agreeable to our most serene elector than a retraction nevertheless if i had only had myself to consult i would not have taken it having committed no fault i ought to have nothing to fear luther having written this letter which was not sent to the legate till after his departure prepared to quit augsburg god had kept him till this hour and his heart praised him for it but he must not tempt god he took leave of his friends poitinger langemental the adelmans auerbach and the prior of the carmelites who had shown him so much christian hospitality on wednesday before daybreak he got up and was ready to depart his friends had advised him to use great precaution lest his intention should be observed and frustrated and he followed their counsels as much as he could a pony which staupitz had left him was brought to the gate of the convent and once more bidding adieu to his brethren he mounted and set off without bridle boots or spurs and unarmed the magistrates had sent one of their officers on horseback who was to accompany him and who knew the roads perfectly the servant led him in the darkness through the silent streets of augsburg towards a small gate which was pierced in the city wall and which councillor langemantel had given orders should be open to him he is still in the power of the legate and the hand of rome may still reach him doubtless did the italians know that their prey was escaping they would sally forth in fury with hue and cry who knows if the intrepid opponent of rome will not yet be seized and immured in a dungeon at length luther and his guide arrive at the little gate and passing through it are out of augsburg then putting their horses to the gallop they make off in all haste luther on departing had left his appeal to the pope in the hands of the prior of pomesal his friends were of the opinion that it should not be sent to the legate and the prior was therefore charged to see to its being fixed up two or three days after the doctor's departure on the gate of the cathedral in the presence of a notary and witnesses this was accordingly done in this document luther declares that he appeals from the most holy father the pope ill informed to the most holy lord and father in christ by name leo the tenth by the grace of god when better informed this appeal had been regularly drawn up and executed in due form by gal de herbrachtingen the imperial notary in the presence of two augustin monks bartholomew utzmeyer and wengel steinbies it was dated sixteenth of october when the cardinal was informed of luther's departure he was astonished and even as he declares in a letter to the elector was frightened and amazed in fact he had grounds for irritation this departure which put so abrupt a termination to negotiation disappointed the hopes which had so long flattered him his ambition was to cure the wounds of the church and re-establish the pope's influence in germany and lo the heretic has escaped not only without having been punished but even without having been humbled the conference had only served to bring more prominently into view on the one hand the simplicity uprightness and firmness of luther and on the other the imperiousness and unreasonable conduct of the pope and his ambassador rome having gained nothing must have lost her authority not having been strengthened had of necessity experienced a new check what will be said at the vatican what tidings will arrive at rome the difficulties of his situation will be forgotten and the failure imputed to his want of skill serra longa and the italians are furious at seeing persons of their ability outwitted by a german monk de vio is scarcely able to conceal his irritation the affront cries for vengeance 
and we shall soon see him giving vent to his wrath in a letter to the elector. End of Book 4, Chapter 9book four chapter ten of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten luther's flight admiration luther's wish the letter to the elector the elector to the legate prosperity of the university luther continued with his guide to flee from augsburg he urged his steed to the utmost speed that the poor animal's strength would permit he thought of the real or supposed flight of john huss the manner in which he was laid hold of and the assertion of his adversaries who pretended that the flight annulled the emperor's safe conduct and entitled them to condemn him to the flames these uneasy thoughts merely crossed luther's mind escaped from the town where he had passed ten days under the terrible hand of rome which had already crushed so many thousand witnesses of the truth and drenched herself with blood now that he is free now that he breathes the pure air of the field and traverses the villages and plains now that he sees himself wonderfully delivered his whole soul magnifies the lord truly he may now say our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers the snare is broken and we are escaped our help is in the name of the lord who made heaven and earth luther's heart is thus filled with joy but his thoughts also revert to de vio the cardinal says he would have liked to have me in his hands to send me to rome no doubt he is chagrined at my escape he imagined that he was master of me at augsburg he thought he was sure of me but he had an eel by the tail is it not a shame in these people to set so high a price upon me they would give many crowns to have me whereas our lord jesus christ was sold for thirty pieces of silver the first day luther travelled fourteen leagues in the evening on arriving at the inn where he was to pass the night he was so fatigued his horse says one of his biographers had a very hard trot that on dismounting he could not stand erect and stretched himself out upon the straw he nevertheless enjoyed some sleep and the next day continued his journey at nuremberg he found staupitz on a visit to the convents of his order and for the first time saw the brief which the pope had sent to cajetan respecting him he was indignant at it in all probability if he had read it before his departure from wittemberg he would never have appeared before the cardinal it is impossible to believe says he that anything so monstrous could emanate from a sovereign pontiff throughout the journey luther was an object of general interest he had not yielded a whit such a victory gained by a mendicant monk over a representative of rome excited universal admiration germany seemed avenged for the contempt of italy the eternal word had been more honoured than the word of the pope and that vast power which had domineered over the world for so many ages had received an important check luther's journey was a triumph people were delighted with the obstinacy of rome hoping that it would hasten her downfall had she not chosen to keep fast hold of dishonest gains had she been wise enough not to despise the germans had she reformed clamant abuses perhaps according to human views things might have returned to the state of death out of which luther had aroused them but the papacy chooses not to yield and the doctor will see himself constrained to bring many other errors to light and to advance in the knowledge and the manifestation of the truth on the twenty sixth of october luther arrived at greifenthal situated at the extremity of the forests of thuringia here he fell in with count albert of mansfeld who had so strongly dissuaded him from going to augsburg the count laughed heartily on seeing his singular equipage 
and laying hands on him obliged him to become his guest shortly after luther resumed his journey he made haste to be at wittemberg by the thirty first of october expecting that the elector would be there at the feast of all saints and that he would be able to see him the brief which he had read at nuremberg had made him fully aware of the danger of his situation in fact being already condemned at rome he could not hope either to remain at wittemberg or to obtain an asylum in a convent or to be at peace and safety anywhere else the protection of the elector might perhaps defend him but he was far from being able to calculate upon it he could not expect any help from the two friends whom he had formerly had at the court staupitz having lost the favour he long enjoyed had quitted saxony spalatin was loved by frederick but had no great influence over him the elector himself was not so well acquainted with the gospel as to encounter manifest perils on account of it however luther saw nothing better which he could do than return to wittemberg and there await the decision of an almighty and merciful god if as several thought he were left at liberty his wish was to devote himself entirely to study and the education of youth luther did arrive at wittemberg by the thirtieth of october but his haste had been to no purpose for neither the elector nor spalatin came to the festival his friends were overjoyed on seeing him again among them the very day of his arrival he hastened to announce it to spalatin i came back to wittemberg to-day safe and sound by the grace of god but how long i shall remain is more than i know i am filled with joy and peace so much so that i cannot help wondering how the trial which i endure appears so great to so many great personages de vio did not wait long after luther's departure to vent all his indignation to the elector his letter breathes vengeance in an assuming tone he gives frederick an account of the conference since friar martin says he in conclusion cannot be brought by paternal methods to acknowledge his error and remain faithful to the catholic church i pray your highness to send him to rome or banish him from your states be assured that this difficult naughty and venomous affair cannot last longer for when i shall have acquainted our most holy lord with all the craft and malice there will soon be an end of it in a postscript in his own hand the cardinal entreats the elector not to sully his own honour and that of his illustrious ancestors for a miserable paltry friar never perhaps was the soul of luther filled with nobler indignation than on reading the copy of this letter which the elector sent him the thought of the sufferings which he is destined to endure the value of the truth for which he is combating the contempt he feels for the conduct of the legate of rome at once fill his heart his reply written under the influence of those feelings is full of the courage dignity and faith which he always manifested in the most difficult crisis of his life he in his turn gives an account of the conference of augsburg and then after exposing the conduct of the cardinal continues i should like to answer the legate in the elector's stead prove that you speak with knowledge i would say to him let the whole affair be committed to writing then i will send friar martin to rome or rather i myself will cause him to be seized and put to death i will take care of my conscience and my honour and allow no stain to sully my fame but as long as your certain knowledge shuns the light and manifests itself only by clamour i cannot give credit to darkness this most excellent prince would be my answer let the reverend legate or the pope himself give a written specification of my errors let them explain their reasons let them instruct me who desire who ask and wish and wait for instruction in so much that even a turk would not refuse to give it if i retract not and condemn myself after they shall have proved to me that the passages which i have cited ought to be understood differently from what i have done then o oh, most excellent elector let your highness be the first to pursue and chase me and let the university discard me and load me with its anger 
nay more and i call heaven and earth to witness let the lord jesus christ reject and condemn me the words which i speak are not dictated by vain presumption but by immovable conviction i am willing that the lord god withdraw his grace from me and that every creature of god refuse to countenance me if when a better doctrine shall have been shown to me i embrace it not if on account of the humbleness of my condition they despise me a poor paltry mendicant friar and if they refuse to instruct me in the way of truth let your highness pray the legate to point out to you in writing wherein i have erred and if they refuse this favour even to your highness let them write their views either to his imperial majesty or to some archbishop of germany what ought i what can i say more let your highness listen to the voice of your honour and your conscience and not send me to rome no man can command you to do it for it is impossible i can be in safety at rome the pope himself is not in safety there it would be to order you to betray christian blood they have paper pens and ink and they have also notaries without number it is easy for them to write and show wherein and how i have erred it will cost less to instruct me by writing while i am absent than while present to accomplish my death by stratagem i resign myself to exile my enemies are so ensnaring me on all sides that i can nowhere live in safety in order that no evil may befall you on my account i in the name of god abandon your territories i will go wherever an almighty and merciful god wishes me to be let him do with me as seemeth to him good thus then most serene elector with veneration i bid you farewell i commend you to almighty god and give you immortal thanks for all your kindness towards me whatever the people among whom i shall live in future i will always remember you and gratefully pray without ceasing for the happiness of you and yours i am still thank god full of joy and i bless him that christ his son counts me worthy of suffering in so holy a cause may he eternally guard your illustrious highness amen this letter so replete with truth made a profound impression on the elector he was shaken by a very eloquent letter says meimburg he never would have thought of delivering an innocent man into the hands of rome perhaps he would have asked luther to remain for some time in concealment but not even in appearance would he have yielded in any way to the menaces of the legate he wrote to his counsellor pfeffinger who happened to be with the emperor to make him acquainted with the real state of matters and beg him to request rome either to put an end to the affair or at least leave it to be decided in germany by impartial judges some days after the elector replied to the legate since dr martin appeared before you at augsburg you ought to be satisfied we did not expect that without having convicted him you would have thought of constraining him to retract none of the learned in our dominions have told us that the doctrine of martin is impious anti-christian and heretical the prince then refuses to send luther to rome or banish him from his states this letter which was communicated to luther filled him with joy good god wrote he to spalatin with what joy i have read it and re-read it i know what confidence may be put in these words so admirable at once for vigour and moderation i fear the romans will not comprehend all that is meant by them but they will at least comprehend that what they thought already finished is not even begun have the goodness to present my thanks to the prince it is strange that he de vio who not long ago was a mendicant monk like me is not afraid to accost the most powerful princes without respect to interpel threaten and command them and treat them with inconceivable pride let him learn that the temporal power is of god and that it is not permitted him to trample its glory under foot 
frederick in answering the legate in a tone which he had not expected had doubtless been encouraged by an address which he had received from the university of wittemberg this university had good reason for declaring in the doctor's favour inasmuch as it was flourishing more and more and eclipsing all the other schools crowds of students flocked from all parts of germany to hear the extraordinary man whose lessons seemed to open a new era to religion and science these youths who came from all the provinces stopped at the moment when they perceived the steeples of wittemberg in the distance and raising their hands to heaven thanked god for making the light of truth shine on this town as formerly on zion and send its rays even to the remotest countries a life and activity hitherto unknown animated the university they ply their studies here like ants wrote luther end of book four chapter ten Book four, chapter eleven of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter eleven Thoughts of Departure Adieus to the Church Critical Moment Luther's Courage Discontentment at Rome Papal Bull Appeal to a Council luther thinking that he might soon be banished from germany employed himself in preparing the acts of the conference of augsburg for publication he wished these acts to remain as evidence of the struggle which he had maintained with rome he saw the storm ready to burst but feared it not day after day he expected the anathemas of rome and arranged and set everything in order that he might be ready when they arrived having tucked up my coat and girt my reins said he i am ready to depart like abraham not knowing whither i shall go or rather knowing well since god is everywhere he intended to leave a farewell letter behind him have the boldness then wrote he to spalatin to read the letter of a man cursed and excommunicated his friends were in great fear and anxiety on his account and begged him to enter himself prisoner in the hands of the elector in order that that prince might somewhere keep him in safe custody his enemies could not understand what it was that gave him so much confidence one day they were talking of him at the court of the bishop of brandenburg and asking on what prop he could be leaning it must be in erasmus said they or capito or some other of the learned that he confides no no replied the bishop the pope would give himself very little trouble with such folks as these his trust is in the university of wittemberg and the duke of saxony thus both were ignorant of the fortress in which the reformer had taken refuge thoughts of departure flitted across luther's mind they arose not from fear but from the foresight of continually recurring obstacles which the free profession of the truth must encounter in germany if i remain here said he the liberty of speaking and writing will as to many things be wrested from me if i depart i will freely unbosom the thoughts of my heart and offer my life to jesus christ france was the country in which luther hoped he would be able untrammelled to announce the truth the liberty which the doctors and university of paris enjoyed seemed to him worthy of envy he was besides agreed with them on many points what would have happened had he been transported from wittemberg to france would the reformation have taken place there as it did in germany would the power of rome have been dethroned and would france which was destined to see the hierarchical principles of rome and the destructive principles of an infidel philosophy long boring in its bosom have become one great focus of gospel light it is useless to indulge in vain conjectures on this subject but perhaps luther at paris might have somewhat changed the destinies of europe and france luther's soul was powerfully agitated as he often preached at the town church in the place of simon hyens pontanus pastor of wittemberg who was almost always sick 
he thought it his duty at all events to take leave of a people to whom he had so often preached salvation i am said he one day in the pulpit i am a precarious and uncertain preacher how often already have i set out suddenly without bidding you farewell in case the same thing should happen again and i not return here receive my adieus after adding a few words more he thus meekly and modestly ended i warn you in fine not to be alarmed though the papal censures let loose all their fury on me impute it not to the pope and wish no ill either to him or any other mortal whatsoever but commit the whole matter to god the moment seemed to have at length arrived the prince gave luther to understand he was desirous of his removal to a distance from wittemberg and the wishes of the elector were too sacred for him not to hasten to comply with them he accordingly made preparations for his departure without well knowing whither he should direct his steps he wished however to have a last meeting with his friends and for this purpose invited them to a farewell repast seated at table with them he was still enjoying their delightful conversation their tender and anxious friendship a letter is brought to him it comes from the court he opens and reads and his heart sinks it is a new order to depart the prince asks why he is so long setting out his soul was filled with sadness still however he took courage and raising his head and looking around on his guests said firmly and joyfully father and mother forsake me but the lord will take me up there was nothing for it but to depart his friends were deeply moved what is to become of him if luther's protector rejects him who will receive him and the gospel and the truth and this admirable work all doubtless must fall with their illustrious witness the reformation apparently is hanging by a thread and at the moment when luther quits the walls of wittemberg will not the thread break luther and his friends spoke little stunned with the blow which was directed against their brother they melt into tears but some moments after a second message arrives and luther opens the letter not doubting he is to find a renewal of the summons to depart but o oh, powerful hand of the lord for this time he is saved the whole aspect is changed as the new envoy of the pope hopes that everything may be arranged by means of a conference remain still so says the letter how important an hour this was and who can say what might have happened if luther who was always in haste to obey the will of his prince had quitted wittemberg immediately after the first message never were luther and the work of the reformation at a lower ebb than at this moment their destinies seemed to be decided but an instant sufficed to change them arrived at the lowest point in his career the doctor of wittemberg rapidly reascended and thenceforward his influence ceased not to increase in the language of a prophet the eternal commands and his servants descend into the depth again they mount up to heaven spalatin having by order of frederick invited luther to lichtenberg to have an interview with him they had a long conversation on the situation of affairs if the censures of rome arrive said luther i certainly will not remain at wittemberg beware of being too precipitate with your journey to france replied spalatin who left telling him to wait till he heard from him only recommend my soul to christ said luther to his friends i see that my adversaries are strong in their resolution to destroy me but at the same time christ strengthens me in my resolution not to yield to them luther at this time published the acts of the conference at augsburg spalatin on the part of the elector had written to him not to do it but it was too late after the publication had taken place the prince approved of it great god said luther in the preface what new what astonishing crime to seek light and truth and more especially to seek them in the church in other words in the kingdom of truth 
in a letter to link he says i send you my acts they are more cutting doubtless than the legate expected but my pen is ready to give birth to far greater things i know not myself whence those thoughts come in my opinion the affair is not even commenced so far are the grandees of rome from being entitled to hope it is ended i will send you what i have written in order that you may see whether i have divined well in thinking that the antichrist of which the apostle paul speaks is now reigning in the court of rome i believe i am able to demonstrate that it is at this day worse than the very turks ominous rumours reached luther from all quarters one of his friends wrote to him that the new envoy of rome had received orders to seize him and deliver him up to the pope another told him that in travelling he had fallen in with a courtier and the conversation having turned on the affairs of germany the courtier declared that he had come under an obligation to deliver luther into the hands of the sovereign pontiff but wrote the reformer the more their fury and violence increase the less i tremble at rome there was great dissatisfaction with cajetan the chagrin which they felt at the failure of the affair at first turned upon him the roman courtiers thought themselves entitled to reproach him with a want of that prudence and finesse which if they are to be believed constitute the first quality of a legate and with having failed on so important an occasion to give pliancy to his scholastic theology he is wholly to blame said they his lumbering pedantry has spoiled all of what use was it to irritate luther by insults and menaces instead of gaining him over by the promise of a good bishopric or even a cardinal's hat these hirelings judged the reformer by themselves however it was necessary to repair this blunder on the one hand rome must give her decision and on the other due court must be paid to the elector who might be of great use in the election of an emperor an event which must shortly take place as it was impossible for roman ecclesiastics to suspect what constituted the strength and courage of luther they imagined that the elector was much more implicated in the affair than he really was the pope therefore resolved to follow another line of conduct he caused his legate in germany to publish a bull confirming the doctrine of indulgences in the very points in which they were attacked but without mentioning either the elector or luther as the reformer had always expressed his readiness to submit to the decision of the roman church the pope thought that he must now either keep his word or stand openly convicted as a disturber of the peace of the church and a contemner of the holy apostolic see in either case it seemed that the pope must gain but nothing is gained by obstinately opposing the truth in vain had the pope threatened to excommunicate every man who should teach otherwise than he ordered the light was not arrested by such orders the wise plan would have been to curb the pretensions of the vendors of indulgences this decree of rome was therefore a new blunder by legalizing clamant errors it irritated all the wise and made it impossible for luther to return it was thought says a roman catholic historian a great enemy of the reformation that this bull had been made solely for the interest of the pope and the mendicants who began to find that nobody would give anything for their indulgences the cardinal de vio published the bull at Linz in austria on the thirteenth of december fifteen hundred and eighteen but luther had already placed himself beyond its reach on the twenty eighth of november in the chapel of corpus christi at wittemberg he had appealed from the pope to a general council of the church he foresaw the storm which was gathering around him and he knew that god alone could avert it still he did as duty called him he must no doubt quit wittemberg were it only for the sake of the elector as soon as the roman anathema should arrive but he was unwilling to quit saxony and germany without a strong protestation this he accordingly drew up and in order that it might be ready for circulation the moment the furies of rome as he expresses it should reach him he caused it to be printed under the express condition that the bookseller should deposit all the copies in his custody 
but the bookseller in his eagerness for gain sold almost the whole while luther was quietly waiting to receive them he felt annoyed but the thing was done this bold protestation spread everywhere in it luther declared anew that he had no intention to say anything against the holy church or the authority of the apostolic see or the pope well advised but continues he considering that the pope who is the vicar of god upon earth may like any other vicar err sin or lie and that the appeal to a general council is the only safeguard against unjust proceedings which it is impossible to resist i feel myself obliged to have recourse to it here then we see the reformation launched on a new course it is no longer made to depend on the pope and his decisions but on a universal council luther addresses the whole church and the voice which proceeds from the chapel of corpus christi must reach the whole members of christ's flock there is no want of courage in the reformer and here he gives a new proof of it will god fail him the answer will be found in the different phases of the reformation which are still to be exhibited to our view end of book four chapter eleven Recording completed by Christopher Smith on the 8th of June, 2017. End of History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Volume 1 by Jean-Henri Mel d'Aubigné. Translated.